Hey there everyone, you know what time it is. It's time for another Strange and Bizarre Cases compilation. This is where I gather up all of the smaller cases I come across that aren't really long enough to be their own video but definitely deserve some spotlight. Special shout out to UnwiseBlood on Twitter for suggesting most of today's cases, all but maybe one or two of them. With that said, let's get into it. On the subject of crime compilations, you could say that today's sponsor, Cook Unity, is criminally tasty. Cook Unity is the first chef to you meal delivery service, delivering freshly prepared, pre selected meals straight up to your door weekly. It's made up of over 70 chefs who feel like great food should be readily available to anyone. Each week, you've got award winning chefs crafting hundreds of globally inspired meals. The meals are made every day in regional micro kitchens, not warehouse production facilities. Meals are delivered fresh, never frozen, and the menu rotates around every week, so there's always something new to try. The meals are made with real ingredients, nothing artificial, with humanely raised meat and organic ingredients when possible. Cook Unity chefs offer a wide array of meals with over seven different dietary preference filters, like vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. The meal I decided to try out today was the Mission-Style Carnitas Burrito by Chef Jose Garces in Brooklyn, New York. The burrito came out great. It tastes like something you'd pay good money for if you went out to eat. It's actually a lot better than most burritos I've had recently. It's also packed with protein, a lot of meat. I definitely recommend you give it a shot. I love that Cook Unity gives me the option of eating restaurant-grade food right in my home with very little prep time. The subscription is super flexible and you can pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time. So go to cookunity.com slash diretrip50 or click the link in the description below and use my code diretrip50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals and try them out for yourself. And now, on to the content. Here we've got... Georgia father is sentenced to prison for poisoning his daughter with antifreeze to avoid paying child support. So here we have the story of a man named Curtis Jack. Curtis was working for Delta Airlines when he met his co-worker, a woman he would soon get into an intimate relationship with. After a while, the woman became pregnant. Curtis, though, wasn't going to stand for it. Immediately after finding out, he began to urge her to terminate the pregnancy, but she refused. He continued to beg her to do it for the remainder of the pregnancy. Regardless, the baby was born in September of 2020, exactly nine months after their first romp. Well, now that Curtis was way past the point of terminating the pregnancy, he was left with one other worry. He didn't want to pay child support. He didn't want to get with the mother and wasn't about to pay any money, so he came up with a different plan. He collected bottles of breast milk set aside for the baby by the mother while she was in the hospital. There, he made his little witch's brew by putting in a dose of antifreeze into the milk before sending it off to his new daughter's grandmother. The grandmother gave the little girl some milk and, within 24 hours, the child was critically ill. She was rushed to the hospital where she tested positive for ethane glycol, a chemical found in antifreeze. As I'm sure a lot of you know, consuming even a tiny amount of antifreeze can be extremely toxic. More than likely, it will cause vomiting within a few moments. In more severe cases, it can lead to kidney damage and even death. Curtis became the main suspect pretty quickly and was taken in for questioning during which he admitted to adding antifreeze to the milk pretty quickly. He told them it was all done in order to avoid paying child support. It goes without saying that the case went to trial soon enough. During the trial, there were testimonies from the mother, the grandmother, law enforcement, and even medical experts who demonstrated how easy it would have been to poison the milk. The South Fulton County Police Sergeant, a man named Dickerson, said, It hit home because it was an 18-day-old baby. It's beyond getting a confession. We still have to prove that someone committed the crime. You still have to prove that the person is guilty. And find him guilty they did. They found Curtis Jack guilty on all counts, one of which was attempted murder. He was sentenced to serve 40 years in prison. Luckily, the baby is doing perfectly fine now after some medical care. This one reads... Son busted after elderly mother found fused to bed sheet covered in feces and maggots. This all started when a concerned neighbor called the police to perform a welfare check on their neighbors who they hadn't seen in months, a man and his mother. Given that packages were piling up at their door and no one was answering when they knocked, they felt that something was likely very wrong. The occupants of the home were a 51-year-old man named Daniel Klein and his elderly mother. Neither of them had been seen in quite a long time before the police came to perform their check. 
When doing so, they knocked on the door and rang the doorbell to no avail. Getting no answer, they decided to walk around to the back of the home and look through the sliding glass windows. There, they could clearly see heaps of trash all over the floor and a disgusting amount of flies swarming about. Fearing that someone was in a dire situation or even dead, the police forced their way into the home. They were immediately hit with a pungent odor, one that they felt could likely be the stench of death. Once inside, though, the police were surprised to come across Daniel, alive and well. They asked him to take him to where his mother was in order to check on her, too. While making their way throughout the home, they came across more and more trash and bugs. Daniel told them that his mother was sleeping at the moment, but they were free to check on her. They found her lying in a bed under a disgusting, soiled blanket. To their relief, though, she was alive, but she was unconscious. However, they were relieved to see that she was at least breathing. Paramedics were called to take her to the hospital. When the medics arrived, they removed the nasty blanket and found that the woman's entire lower half was covered in dried poop and maggots. They said that her toenails resembled, quote, ram's horns. When trying to take her, they found that she was actually fused to the bed and couldn't be moved. Eventually, they were able to cut her out and take her to the hospital, where she was found to be in critical condition. Daniel told the police that he was his mother's only caretaker and that she hadn't wanted to get out of bed for three to four weeks, but the police suspect it was likely for months. Daniel Klein was charged with abusing a dependent person and reckless endangerment while his mother remains in critical condition in the hospital. The Delaware County District Attorney told news outlets, This is one of the worst cases I've seen in my four years as district attorney here. And for this person, the defendant Klein, to do this to his own mother is just... I can't even imagine. Daniel has remained at the George Hill Correctional Facility as he is unable to pay his $50,000 bail. He's due back in court any time now. Now we've got... Parole board members release a man who fatally stabbed 11-year-old boy less than 24 hours later. A 37-year-old man named Cressetti Brand was serving 16 years behind bars for home invasion and aggravated assault when a judge decided to hold a hearing for his possible parole on March 13th. Cressetti had originally been paroled in October before being reassessed shortly after when he threatened a woman over text. Both the judge and Cressetti were expected to attend this new hearing, with the latter being informed while he was still in prison. However, for some reason, the parole board chair, Leanne Miller, decided to write a report that approved his parole on the 12th, one day before the court. Crosetti Brand hopped out of jail and, in less than 24 hours, made his way up to the home of Lateria Smith and her son. Crosetti ambushed them both and stabbed them in the doorway of their home, injuring Lateria with a stab wound to the chest and murdering her 11-year-old son, Jaden. It soon came to light that Lateria had actually begged for an order of protection against Cressetti in the months leading up to this. This sparked national outrage, as not only was the order of protection not even a factor in his parole, nothing was done to prevent him from attacking the woman and her son. The chair of the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, Donald Shelter, along with the board member, Leanne Miller, who signed the papers, received heavy backlash for their random decision to grant Cressetti parole in the first place. The two soon decided to resign. Both the Illinois Department of Corrections and the Illinois Prisoner Review Board claimed that they didn't know anything about the protection order, but emails leaked that showed they did. So, the agency stated, The department sincerely apologizes for any confusion its previous statement may have caused. Now, Cressetti Brand is facing a murder charge along with a whole load of other charges, one of which is violation of a protection order. This is hardly even the first time this has ever happened, and that brings us to this next case. This case is, Fiend who punched 9-year-old girl at Grand Central in unprovoked attack says he hit her because he was thirsty. A man named John Carlos Zaruzella was arrested on April 4th for punching a woman multiple times, leaving her with a bloody nose and a black eye. He was arrested that very day and was arraigned on assault, reckless endangerment, and harassment charges. It wasn't long before his bail was set. With the police unable to hold him due to recent bail reforms, he was released shortly after on April 9th. Prosecutors have to have what they call good cause to hold someone for longer than five days on misdemeanor charges, so they had to let him go. Jean was no stranger to this process, as he had a long history of other arrests. In fact, he was on supervised release from prison just one year prior. Well, the exact same day he was released, on April 9th, Jean walked up to a random 9-year-old girl at Grand Central Terminal and punched her right in the face. He then attempted to assault another person while security was called. 
While he tried to flee, the police came out and took him into custody. He told the police that he had punched the little girl because he was thirsty. Well, he was arrested again, and this time he was given a $100,000 bail. He told the detectives, I hit the girl in the face because I was thirsty. Maybe I hit her in the face by accident. The little girl was taken to the NYU Langone Tisch Hospital following the attack. She is expected to recover. Giancarlo Sarzuela is now facing two charges of third-degree assault, endangering the welfare of a child, third-degree attempted assault, and second-degree harassment. He has been ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. He's all set to be back in court soon enough. Now we've got... Crazed woman shoots random drivers on Florida interstate because God told her to via the solar eclipse. There wasn't any way we were going to get through this recent eclipse without hearing some pretty crazy stories, and well, that blessed us with a Florida woman story, of all things. A 22-year-old woman named Talon Nichelle Celestine was staying at a motel in Holmes County on the day of the eclipse. This was when she told motel staff that God had spoken to her and given her the order to go on a shooting spree during the eclipse. This was despite the fact that Florida is located nowhere near where the eclipse actually took place and she wouldn't even be seeing it. Regardless, she hopped into her purple Dodge Challenger and drove out onto Interstate 10. She rolled her window down and began to fire at random cars in Washington County. She shot at one passing car several times. The driver of this car was grazed by one of the bullets on his arm and was hit with glass shards when his window shattered. He pulled over to the shoulder of the highway, but Talon kept driving. She kept driving west on Interstate 10, armed with both a 9mm handgun and an AR-15. She soon opened fire on another passing vehicle. That driver was actually hit in the neck and later rushed to the hospital. Talon continued driving until the highway patrol managed to catch up to her and pull her over. She told the police simply that she did what she did because God had told her to do it. They searched her car, recovering both her rifle and her handgun. Talon was taken into the Holmes County Jail. There, she was booked on charges of attempted murder, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, and improper discharge of a firearm. As of now, the police aren't really sure which gun she was using to do the majority of the shooting. They also aren't sure whether or not her guns were obtained legally. Given that this is very recent, the investigation is still ongoing. And now we've got, Fiancé of Man Killed in Staged Robbery Speaks Out. Alright, I cut this headline down a little bit from what it originally said because honestly it just makes an already confusing case just that much more confusing. It's really hard to describe why this one is so weird without telling it, so let's get into it. In January in Houston, a 22-year-old man named Russ Howard Scott decided to participate in a little master plan to get a visa for a few people so they could stay in the United States. Apparently, there's a thing called the U-Visa. According to the Department of Homeland Security, a U-Visa is granted to victims of certain crimes to aid law enforcement in solving cases. It grants the victim temporary immigration status, including work authorization, temporary immigration status for qualifying family members of the victim, and the possibility of lawful permanent resident status. So basically, they can stay in the country if they're currently aiding law enforcement in some way. Two foreign nationals decided that they would abuse this method. In order to do so, they decided to stage a robbery. This is where the man behind the whole scheme, William X. Winfrey, decided to pay Rasoud Scott to pretend to rob them. Then, the fake victims would get to be a part of the investigation. They would pretend to aid the police in solving that robbery and get this visa. In reality, William and Rasoud had actually done this twice before in order to get U visas for several other people. As I'm sure a lot of you can gauge on your own, this plan was a disaster waiting to happen for a myriad of reasons. The night came, January 26th on 4400 Lockwood Drive at the Swift Gas Station. Once they put the plan into action, a good Samaritan decided to step in. This man was Jesus Varga, who pulled out a gun and shot Rasoud, assuming he was saving two people from a violent robbery as a man held a gun to them. Well, Jesus had a problem. He was on probation. So, despite feeling that he was acting in good faith to save some lives, he told them not to tell anyone he was there and fled the scene. He wasn't supposed to be in possession of a gun at all. However, he did eventually meet with the police and admit that he was simply afraid of being arrested for that. Investigating the case, the police found messages on Telegram between Rasoud and William as they coordinated the fake robberies. They found out that they had committed an almost identical fake robbery in order to get some U visas for some other people the night before. 
In that case, they had actually already succeeded in getting a visa for one of those fake victims. In another case from a year prior, they had managed to get four visas for some others. Due to setting this whole thing up, William X. Winfrey is now being charged with murder. Rasoud's wife is now left to raise their two kids by herself. She surprisingly, of all things, blames lax gun laws on what happened that night. She said, He didn't deserve what happened to him at all. He was making a dumb decision. I'm not defending him, of course, but he didn't deserve to die. Somebody still lost a life at the end of the day. Have some decorum. She added, It would have eventually caught up to him, and he would have had to learn the hard way. He just took him out. He didn't get the chance to fix his mistakes. She also wants to see Jesus Varga put in jail, saying that he is the one who made the decision to kill. The police, though, haven't decided whether or not they're going to charge Jesus at all. By this point, there aren't any records that show he has been. There also aren't any records showing whether or not the fake victims have been charged with anything either. And uh, this one is, Priest is jailed after refusing to open the door to an ambulance during his gay orgy during which a man overdosed on erectile pills. Here's a truly bizarre story that starts out in an apartment in Dobrawa Gornicza in Poland. This is where a priest, Father Thomas Zmarzli from the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary of the Angels, along with his clergy, were hosting a little party. According to those close to the people involved, quote, the event was organized by clergy and was purely sexual. Its participants took potency pills. In the early hours of the morning, a male prostitute had taken a lot of boner popper pills and got a little bit sick. Well, a lot bit sick. He was kicked out, taken outside the apartment and placed on the ground outside while an ambulance was called. The ambulances soon arrived, finding the unconscious man and calling the police. The problem is, they tried to open the door to talk to the people inside the apartment. Fathers Marsley refused to let any of them in. Luckily, the sick man managed to get some medical attention if his erection lasted for more than four hours and made a full recovery. Eventually, he discharged himself from the hospital and went home on his own. Well, the police didn't take too kindly to Fathers Marsley refusing to answer any questions. He was eventually arrested on charges of various sexual offenses, supplying drugs, and failing to provide assistance to a person in danger of loss of life or serious bodily harm. The father denied that he had been holding a gay orgy to his superiors, but all the evidence showed otherwise. After a trial, he was sentenced to 18 months in prison for his crimes. He was also ordered to pay the equivalent of $3,820 to the victim in compensation, along with a little bit more to contribute to a charity benefiting victims of similar crimes. Being the kind of trial it was, it was held behind closed doors. It seems that the decisions are final and there won't be any sort of appeal. The priest was let go from his clergy after this case hit the media. This one is a doozy. Man arrested for allegedly rubbing his buttocks against water tap at Tokyo Park. Well, this is a story that pretty well explains itself with the headline alone, but here we go. The police out in the Suginami ward of Tokyo were informed that a strange man was giving himself a little action by rubbing his booty hole all over the tap of a water fountain in a park. After they were called, they managed to find the suspect, a 56-year-old man riding around in Setagaya on a bicycle with his lower half exposed for all to see. When he was caught, he told the police that this was all done in order to satisfy his sexual desires. He told them that he had used binoculars to make sure nobody was around before he did what he did in order not to expose anyone. The police, searching his phone, found a picture of him rubbing his anus all over the water fountain. So he was arrested on suspicion of property damage. They also found a picture of him completely naked in a public park and hit him with charges of public indecency as well. The park turned off the water fountain and blocked it off from use. They're planning to just throw it out and replace it entirely. This one is, a uh, Sierra Leone declares emergency over drug Kush, made from human bones. So, this is probably the worst drug I've ever heard of since Jankum. They're calling it Kush, but it's very likely not the kind of Kush that you're thinking of. This is more like something straight out of Resident Evil. This case comes up because, just recently, the president of Sierra Leone, a country in West Africa, has declared a national emergency because so many people are using the new drug. Kush is described as a psychoactive blend of addictive substances, but it's the ingredients that make it truly terrifying. 
It includes cannabis to start, but quickly gets more out of hand, also including fentanyl, tramadol, formaldehyde, and real ground-up human bones. Interestingly enough, the drug would have the same effect without the bones, leading people to wonder why the bones are even included at all. In fact, due to the sheer amount of people stealing human bones to make the drug, cemeteries have been forced to tighten up their security within the past few years as people kept getting caught stealing entire skeletons. The president has called the drug a death trap, saying that it posed an all-out existential crisis for the country. The drug causes people to fall asleep or pass out while up and about, causing them to fall over and injure themselves, some even ending up dying. Some space out so badly that they wander out into traffic and get hit by cars. Plenty of people are helplessly addicted and, although there isn't an official death toll, it is said to at least be in the high hundreds within just the last few months. The president said in a nationwide broadcast, our country is currently faced with an existential threat due to the ravaging impact of drugs and substance abuse, particularly the devastating synthetic drug Kush. He also said that the fatality rate has been steadily rising and only growing worse. He directed officials to set up a task force specifically to deal with the drug. Centers are to be put up in every district with trained staff dealing with addiction symptoms. However, as of right now, the only drug rehab center in the entire country is in Freetown and it has an occupancy limit of only a few hundred. The facility has been described as less than adequate, with it being compared to more of a holding area than a rehab center. Law enforcement agencies have also been pressured to dismantle the supply chain of the drugs and arrest anyone involved in production or distribution. The police are also now told to crack down much harder on grave robbers. Police have been stationed to watch over cemeteries at night, especially those without fencing. Citizens have criticized the president, saying that, despite his good intentions, he isn't qualified for the job and lacks the drive to keep pursuing the issue. The whole thing has resulted in normal citizens taking the law into their own hands to deal with the issues. Right now, it has been said that roughly two-thirds of patients in some hospitals within the country are there only for Kush-related problems. As of the making of this video, the problem does not seem to be slowing down. Now we've got, Iowa Witch Burns Stranger's Porch After No One Answers Door. Here we have the story of who has been called the Iowa Witch lately. This woman, 46-year-old Michelle Young, apparently really wanted to talk to a certain friend. She came up to a stranger's home at 4.30pm and stood on the porch, knocking and waiting for a response three times. However, nobody answered any of her knocks. So naturally, she decided to set their house on fire by burning a bunch of clothes and other items on the porch. According to later statements, she said that she had been under the impression that her friend was living at this random home at the time, which it seems she wasn't. She stood in front of the house as the fire raged, remaining there, motionless, until firefighters arrived. Luckily, they were able to put the fire out fairly quickly and the house didn't suffer any major damage. The police were called and Michelle frankly admitted to setting the fire, saying that she had scooped up some miscellaneous items on the ground over a period of two hours in order to get some kindling for the arson. She told the police that she was a witch herself and she had seen a novelty sign on the home saying witch is welcome, assuming it was meant for her. The whole thing was caught on the homeowner's security cameras so she wouldn't have been able to deny it anyway. In her mugshot, Michelle has a great big grin and wild hair, definitely going for the most insane look she possibly could. The owner of the home has said that she didn't know Michelle and had never seen her before. Michelle has said that she didn't intend to hurt anyone and would have stopped the fire before it got too out of control. Given that she also had a crack pipe, she was charged with reckless use of fire and possession of drug paraphernalia. She's being held on a $5,000 cash-only bond. And this one be, Man in Wheelchair Goes on Stabbing Spree in Queens. Out in Queens in New York City, a 31-year-old wheelchair-bound man named Kareem Phillips decided to go on a killing spree on the city streets. One Saturday at around noon, he set out with a knife to stab as many people as he could. He rolled over and stabbed one 56-year-old man in the back. This man was able to scramble away into a friend's house where he called 911. Then, Kareem moved over to a 69-year-old woman and chased her in his chair. He punched her in the face, knocking her to the ground, and ended by stabbing her in the torso. Others on the streets called the police and filmed the action as it took place. Soon after, Kareem moved on and stabbed a 35-year-old man in his chest. That man then walked over to the hospital himself. And then finally, Kareem stabbed one more 46-year-old woman in her forearm. Five officers arrived shortly after and surrounded Kareem. 
They came to find him swinging two different kitchen knives around, one of which he threw at an officer. He was taken into police custody and indicted on two counts of attempted murder along with various other crimes, mainly charges of assault and weapon possession. He's facing up to 65 years in prison if convicted. Luckily, all of the victim's injuries were non-life-threatening and they were able to be treated at local hospitals shortly after. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you want, go ahead and give it a like, it really helps me out in the algorithm, and hey, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I now have a podcast set up with four of my friends, Brugly, Knight, Raymundo, and Fox Akimbo. Go ahead and check that out, it's pretty entertaining, I think. If you want, go ahead and follow me on social media, because if anything would ever happen to this channel, that would be the only way you'd ever hear about it. I also really appreciate when people follow me on Patreon. There you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Channel memberships are back up too, and you can get the same benefits there as well. This has been your host Kyle, thank you, and good night.